uh, as we finish this No Ordinary Life series, I have a really challenging um, reality to share with you. It is difficult to be Christian in America. Now, now let me clarify, it's not difficult to become a Christian. Becoming a Christian is simply something God does through the gift of baptism where he pours faith into you and helps you to trust and believe in the promises of Jesus. That through his death and his resurrection, we have everlasting life and hope and peace and love. Becoming a Christian is really easy. But being a Christian, that's really different. Really difficult, that is. You see, being a Christian, becoming a Christian uh, is a one-time thing, but being a Christian is ongoing. Every day, the Bible describes it as a walk, as a journey together. And it's not a journey that's performance-based, where if you don't do enough good things, you are out. But it's a journey where God is actively at work in you and in me, changing us. And we say, come as you are, and becoming a Christian is just like that, come as you are. But being a Christian is the next part. Become who you are. God has so much more in store for your life, more in store for the lives of the people you care about. He is infinitely, infinitely greater and better than you have ever hoped for or desired. And walking on this journey throughout Scripture, there's a lot of really challenging things, things that uh, the life of a Christian should look like. But for many of us, it doesn't. And today, what I want to share, I want to tell you that we are actually up against a great obstacle. Not an evil one, not an inherently wrong one, just a great challenge as Americans. And here's the obstacle I want to put before you. We are incredibly wealthy and incredibly blessed. And we live in a culture that tells us every single day, day after day, that we don't have enough. That our life is missing something and we need more. You don't believe me? Did you know in 2019 almost $240 billion were spent in the U.S. alone just to market to you and convince you that you need to buy something else? Almost $240 billion just to tell you your life is missing something, something really important. Now, I'm not mad at marketers. I just know they're really good at their job. Something I've discovered here during this time of quarantine and safer at home, uh, something I've discovered is that Amazon is significantly less fun when you don't get next day delivery. Because for me, I'm a person who loves instant gratification. I like the opportunity to buy something I want and have it right away. And I took for granted how quickly Amazon could turn things around. I could buy all kinds of bizarre stuff from all around the world, and just like that, it would be at my doorstep, available for me to enjoy and then cast aside. But now, in this season, some things take several weeks. And in fact, the Easter eggs that we put in those uh, Holy Week baskets, or those Holy Week bags, those were on loan to us from Grace Lutheran Church. Because our Easter eggs, which I ordered two weeks before Easter, Amazon said weren't going to arrive until three weeks after Easter. We have a culture that is constantly inundated with the need to purchase more things. And whether you know it or not, you and I fall victim to this. We constantly see ourselves spending more money on things that are helpful but not necessary. And in doing so, we unintentionally create this habit, this frame of mind that is unchristian, this frame of mind that says, if only I have something else, my life will be better, my life will be complete. I just need more. To give you a good picture of this, in 2019, Americans spent $97 billion on their pets. That's a lot of money. Now, I love Ralph, Emily's cat, and I love pets, but that is a lot of money on animals. Not only this, we spent $27 billion on infant clothes last year. Now, 
I have a baby coming in about a month and a half, and here's the thing, babies need clothes. But $27 billion worth of clothes? We were looking through our old clothes for this new baby to see what we can reuse from Elijah, and we realized that we have all kinds of clothes that are all long sleeve because our Elijah was born in the winter. And long sleeve for a summer baby here is probably not going to work, so we're going to probably need some different clothes for our newborn. But I, as we were looking at these multiple bins of old clothes, I realized just how easy it is to think our life is incomplete. And the truth of the matter is, no matter what clothes we put that newborn in, in like a month and a half or less, they won't fit and we'll have to replace them with something different. Now here's the real kicker. In 2019, Americans spent 200, actually sorry, 2018, uh, Americans spent $254 billion dollars on alcohol. Now, I love a good beer and I love a good uh, whiskey or bourbon. I, I love alcohol and drinking it responsibly can be okay. But $254 billion in one year just on alcohol. Now, here's the thing that really baffled me. St. Jude's Hospital. St. Jude's Hospital does an incredible amount of work helping heal children, caring for those who are sick and those who are dying, researching, researching and studying and discovering all kinds of awesome, awesome ways to treat illness. Do you know with that $254 billion we spent on alcohol, we could annually fund 254 additional St. Jude's Hospitals? Wow. There's potential for you and for me in the decisions we make and the choices we live by to make a significant impact in our world. And this is what we as Christians are called to do. To see our resources not as a need for more, but as an opportunity to serve. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes about this. He's concluding this letter to Timothy, a man becoming a pastor, a man serving as a pastor. He's concluding this letter, and he writes this. Uh, after talking about what it means to be the church, to live as a church, who should lead the church, he says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and depraved of truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. See, in this letter, Paul writes to Timothy about how to be a godly person, how to live as a Christian in this world, how to be a Christian after having become one. And he talks a lot about being godly, having the character of God, walking in the ways of God, doing what God would do for this world, godliness. And yet, he says, there are some who will treat godliness as a means of great gain. If only I speak with more integrity, then I will get the promotion. If only I give more generously, then God will bless me more abundantly. If only I act like I love you, you will think that I love you. Have you ever encountered this attitude? Or had this attitude? If I can just give the appearance of being someone I'm not, if I can put on a face and act like things are okay, eventually they'll become okay. I'll be more accepted, I'll be more loved, I'll be more desired if only I have this appearance of being godly. But godliness is not a means of gain. In fact, he goes on in verse 6 and he says this, Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. See, godliness by itself is not adequate for our lives to fill us with the peace and the joy and the hope that God intends for us. If godliness is a means to an end, the way by which we accomplish whatever we're setting out to do. But he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he goes on and he says this, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. 
Paul says, look, godliness, to be a Christian, to walk in the way of Jesus, is no ordinary life. It's not a life where we're consumed with the need for something more, with the desire that says, if only my life has, then I will be okay. No, instead, godliness comes with contentment. Being okay with where we are. Not complacent, not lazy and, ap- and apathetic, but being okay to say, my life is enough in Jesus. And I don't need the latest and greatest. I don't need that other thing. I can choose to live differently because I have everything I need. Now, sometimes when we hear words like this, our mind goes immediately to this idea that says, well, money is evil. Having money is evil. Wealthy people are evil. So we should abandon the idea of having money and we should hate those who do and we should blank. Come up with whatever reason we want to fill in that blank with why somebody else is the problem. But he goes on in verse 9, he says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Look, it is this love of money, this desire to have more, this attitude that says, I am not okay with what I have, but my life needs something else it's missing. This will pierce us and bring many pains. But then Paul continues. After celebrating uh, Timothy in this next section, verses 11 through 16, he talks about uh, pursue righteousness and godliness and faith, love, steadfastness and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. He says, look, Timothy, this will not be easy. It won't be simple, but do it. Pursue what is good. Pursue what is beneficial. Pursue what promotes Jesus. Then he comes back to those who are rich. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, he says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. That is, charge them not to be arrogant. Not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Paul says, to those who are rich, who have lots, this is what you should do. Don't be arrogant. Don't set your hope on if only my 401k uh, looks a little better. If only my retirement is a little higher, if only the market rebounds, don't set your hopes on if only I have more and can do more with my money, then life will be good. No, instead, this is what we're to do. Set our hopes on God, who richly provides everything we need. Now, real quick, I need to take an aside and say this. If you are doing things the way God intends with your money, there's a really good chance that it will financially go well for you. And this is not prosperity gospel that says, if you believe hard enough, then God will bless you enough. No, instead, there's a really true and natural thing that happens. If we spend less than we have and we live with contentment, and we practice good habits with our money and our budgeting, and we wisely save and invest for the future, there's a good chance that when the future comes, you will have more than enough, and you will be provided for. Now, your measure of enough may look different than someone else's, and that's okay. But God is faithful, and he consistently provides for us, for his people. And we don't need to be consumed with this worry or this need to go and fill a void by purchasing something more or shopping or getting something different or working harder to have a bigger 401k. It doesn't matter 
if your retirement has disappeared in the last seven weeks? Because God will provide. And if you continue to trust in him and place your hope in him, he will find a way to give you your daily need of food and a place to live, of clothing on your back. He will provide. Paul, he writes and says, For the rich in this age, don't be arrogant. But instead, here's what you need to do. He says, Do good. Be rich in good works. Be generous and ready to share. Store up treasure for yourselves as a good foundation for the future, so that you may take hold of that which is truly life. For you and for me as Christians, this no ordinary life that God has given us is one that sees in Jesus we have enough. In Jesus, everything we need has been given to us. And for now, in our times of wanting and our times of lack, where our financial resources don't look like we want them to, we turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I trust you to take care of me. Help me to use everything you've given wisely. And when things are going great and we seem to be prospering and everything seems more than okay, that's when we look at Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus. Now what? What can I do with these resources? Who can I bless? How can I help? What difference can I make to do good for the sake of my neighbor? Now, I imagine these numbers I shared at the beginning, the $97 billion on our pets or the $27 billion on baby clothes or $254 billion on alcohol. What if you and I as Christians looked at all that we had and said, we have enough? What if we looked at all that we had and said, God, how can I use whatever I have to do good? And we just took 10% of that amount and made a difference. We just took a small fraction of that 97 billion and said, let's do good with this. What then would that look like? Also, Ralph has discovered a plastic bag at my feet. So if you hear that rustling, that's the noise of a cat enjoying a bag at my feet. There he is, all right. Thanks, Tyler. Hey, Ralph. In case you don't know, this is Ralph. He's uh, Emily and Tyler's pet, and he's been very kindly not making an appearance for the last several weeks, but thought he would today. Church, what can we do with our resources? You see, when we live as a people who are content, who say, I have more than enough, I'm not going to be more loved if I have nicer clothes. I'm not going to feel more peace if I have a faster car. I'm not going to be a better person in the eyes of anybody if I have blank. If we instead shift our focus to say everything will be okay, we have enough in Christ. We get to take everything God has given us And rather than holding on to it with fear or carefully giving it out for the things we've desperately been wanting, we get to just open our hands and say, God, what do you want to do today? What opportunities do you want to bless others and how can I be a part of that? This is the life God has called you and I to. A life that is content, that is not desperately needing something more, but says, God, whatever you've given, let me use it to bring you glory. I read just the other day that in Knox County, in this area, local nonprofits over the course of the last seven weeks of this shutdown have lost almost $12 million in revenue. 12 million. These are organizations in our community who are desperately making a difference, who are desperately working with everything they have, stretching their dollars to try to serve the hungry and the homeless and those who've been trafficked and those who've been abused and those who are suffering all kinds of pain. And just in the last couple of weeks, they have lost almost $12 million. So church, this is my encouragement and my challenge to you. What if we, as God's people, said we have enough? We can choose to buy those things that bring us great joy and to live that way. That's okay. But what if we do that alongside choosing to give radically, like nobody else, to say, I want my finances to bless the world around me as a demonstration that God is 
enough for me. And I'm really excited and encouraged because I know when we as God's people see this as our priority, God will always do great things in us, in our community, and in the world around us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are enough, that your Son has given his life, that we could have this abundant life, and we need not chase after more stuff for satisfaction, more stuff for any kind of appearance, more stuff to live the life we think people want us to have. God, we thank you that you fill every emptiness and void. We pray that you would help us to use everything we own and every resource you've given wisely. That we can be a people not desperately desiring more and more and more, but a people who instead see opportunity at our doorstep to love our neighbor, to serve our community, to be rich in good works, that you might be glorified, that those who are far off might be connected to you, that your love would go forth in our community. God, may we be this people who live unlike anybody else, this different, not ordinary life, that through us, your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Amen.